Hi, everyone. On today's podcast, we're going to be talking about the evidence on due dates. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Evidence-Based Birth Podcast. We are doing a short series all about different medical reasons for induction. So far, we've talked about your water breaking before the start of labor. We've talked about induction for big babies and advanced maternal age. And today, I want to talk a little bit about the concept of due dates and tell you about the free webinar that I am hosting this Thursday, this Friday, and this coming Monday. So we have free webinars on November 8th, November 9th, and November 12th. And each webinar will be similar. So it won't be a different topic. Each time will be the same topic, but they will be live and I will be answering questions live. And we're going to be talking about the evidence on elective induction at 39 weeks. So if you want to get the latest research information about induction at 39 weeks, make sure you sign up for our free webinar by going to ebbirth.com slash webinar. In today's podcast, what I want to do is give you a little introduction to this topic so that you'll be prepped for the webinars this week. But before I get started, my four-year-old just came home from preschool and she wants to give you all a message. Well, maybe you can tell us what you were for Halloween. I was a rainbow unicorn, sparkly and sparkly, so be- beautiful with a headband, with hair and a horn and a dress and a little tail. All right. Thanks, Susie. And with that, we'll move on. So in the webinar, we're going to be talking all about elective induction at 39 weeks. And before you attend that webinar, I just want to make sure that we kind of all have some of the same background information about the evidence on due dates themselves. So in today's podcast, I want to talk about how due dates are calculated and the accuracy of these calculations. This topic is important because inductions for non-medical reasons have been rising globally over the last 30 years. And according to the DeClerc et al. listening to mother survey published in 2013, Inducing labor because the pregnancy is full term and you're close to the due date is the number one reason for inductions in the United States. So in the webinar, I'm going to talk about the big study that was published this year called the ARRIVE trial. But in the meantime, I do want you to understand some basics about due dates. So we're going to talk about what it means to be full term, how due dates are commonly calculated, and the most accurate way to determine gestational age. I want to go back in time and talk with you about the old definitions of term pregnancy. Term pregnancy used to be defined as a five-week period between 37 weeks and zero days of pregnancy and 41 weeks and six days, and anything in between there was considered normal. And then we used to have preterm being when you're born less than 37 weeks, zero days, and postterm was when you're born greater than 41 weeks and six days. However, over time, research began to accumulate showing that health problems were more common at certain points during this five-week, quote, term period. In particular, newborns were more likely to die, so the infant mortality rate was higher if they were born before 39 weeks or after 41 weeks, although the overall risk was still very low. Researchers also found that the chance of a newborn having health complications was lowest if they were born between 39 weeks and zero days and 40 weeks and six days. So in 2012, a group of experts came together to redefine term pregnancy. And based on their review of the research evidence, they broke the five-week term period into separate groups. And this research was published by Spong et al. in 2013. They created four separate groups. So there's the early term babies that are born between 37 weeks and zero days, the 38 weeks and six days. Full term, which is 39 weeks and zero days to 40 weeks and six days. Late term, which is during the 41th week, so between 41 weeks and zero days to 41 weeks and six days. And then post term was defined as 42 weeks and zero days or later. And one of the first questions you get asked when you're pregnant is, what's your due date? So let's talk about how due dates are calculated. Now, almost everybody uses something called Negley's rule. And this rule assumes that you had a 28-day menstrual cycle and that you ovulated exactly on the 14th day of your cycle. However, as a side note, some healthcare providers will adjust your due date for longer or shorter menstrual cycles. With Negley's rule, you add seven days to the first day of the last period, and then you count forward nine months, which creates an estimated due date of 40 weeks after the first day of the last period. 
But where did Nagali's rule come from? Well, it actually came from a professor in the Netherlands named Herman Borhov, who created this rule in 1744. In his book, he explained how you can calculate an estimated due date. He based this on the records of 100 pregnant women and figured out that estimating the due date can be done by adding seven days to the last period and then adding nine months. However, his words and his text can be interpreted one of two ways. Either you add seven days to the first day of the last period, or you add seven days to the last day of the last period. And this is the original quote, which I found in an article that was written by Basket and Nageli in the year 2000, all about Nageli's rule. Herman Borhoff wrote in the 1700s, quote, Women, for the most part, are impregnated after the end of their period. Numerous experiments undertaken in France confirm this. For of 100 births altogether, 99 came about in the ninth month after the last menstruation. By counting one week after the last period and by reckoning the nine months of gestation from that time. For at that time, the uterus is purged and empty and the plethora are drained out. Later on in the year 1812, someone named Carl Negley wrote about Herman Borhoff's suggestion, and that's where it got the name Negley's Rule. He wrote, quote, Women always conceive after the last menstruation and scarcely at any other time. The usual calculation of the duration of pregnancy, namely, starting from the last menstruation, is correct in most instances. In conception within the last third of the cycle, or in the second half between two periods, is unusual and an exception to the rule. Again, Negley did not explain whether you should add seven days to the beginning of the last period or to the last day of the last period. As the 1800s went on, different doctors interpreted Negley's rule in different ways, but most added seven days to the last day of the last period. However, by the early 1900s, for some unknown reason, American obstetrical textbooks adopted a form of Negley's rule that added seven days to the first day of the last period. And so this brings us to today where almost anyone who receives an estimated due date is using a form of Negley's rule that adds seven days to the first day of your last period and then counts forward nine months. This rule was not based on any current evidence and might not have even been intended by Negley. Later on in the 1900s, doctors started using ultrasound, and soon after that, ultrasound measurement replaced the last menstrual period as the most reliable way to define the gestational age of your baby. There is a whole bunch of research on this topic, all showing that ultrasounds done in early pregnancy are actually more accurate at dating your pregnancy than using the last menstrual period. And randomized trials have found that if you have an early ultrasound to date the pregnancy, you're less likely to be induced for a post-term pregnancy. In other words, because you're increasing the accuracy of dating of your pregnancy, you're less likely to be mislabeled as being post-term. In one large observational study that enrolled more than 17,000 women in Finland and was published by Tapoli and Hillisma in 2001, researchers found that an ultrasound at any time point between 8 weeks and 16 weeks was more accurate than the last menstrual period date. When ultrasound was used instead of a, quote, certain last menstrual period, in other words, when the mother was certain about the date she had her last period and you compared that to an ultrasound, the ultrasound date resulted in a much lower number of having a post-term pregnancy pregnancy, your chance of having a post-term pregnancy if you date your pregnancy with the last menstrual period was 10%, and it went down to 3% if you used an ultrasound to date the pregnancy. So why is using your last menstrual period to calculate your due date less accurate? Well, there's a couple of reasons. First, you can have an irregular menstrual cycle or a cycle that's not 28 days. You might be uncertain about the date of your last menstrual period or recall it incorrectly. Also, many people do not ovulate on the 14th day of their cycle. And not only that, but once you conceive, the embryo may take longer to implant in the uterus for some people. So when you have a longer implantation time is what we call it, when it takes longer for the pregnancy to actually implant in the uterus, that means you're going to have a longer pregnancy. Also, there's something called the number five bias, whereas humans were more likely to remember numbers that end in the number five, which could lead you to not remembering your last menstrual period date correctly. Now, in a recent study published by Kambalia et al. in 2013, researchers looked at ultrasound scans done at different time points during the pregnancy, and they found the most accurate time to perform an ultrasound to determine gestational age was 11 to 14 weeks. This was more accurate than any of the other ultrasound scans and more accurate than the last menstrual period date. 
However, the accuracy of using an ultrasound to date a pregnancy sees a significant decline starting at about 20 weeks. If you use an estimated due date from either the last menstrual period or from an ultrasound after 20 weeks, this leads to a much higher rate of pre and post-term births. In other words, a much higher rate of births that are mislabeled as preterm or post-term. In fact, when you get into the third trimester, ultrasounds at that time point are much less accurate at predicting gestational age. This is because they're measuring the size of the baby and comparing that baby to a standard size baby. Now, earlier in pregnancy, all babies are about the same size. But if your baby's going to be larger than average, perhaps because you or your partner are tall, they will be perceived as closer to being done when the ultrasound is performed and your due date could be moved up incorrectly. And the reverse is also true for babies who will be smaller than average at term. Their due date could be moved to a later date. And this could be risky if the baby's experiencing growth restriction as growth restricted babies have a higher risk of stillbirth towards the end of pregnancy. Because third trimester ultrasounds are notoriously inaccurate, accurate and can cause major complications if you mislabel the baby's gestational age. The American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists says the due dates should only be changed in the third trimester in very rare circumstances. ACOG also has 2017 guidelines, which are interesting because they talk about when to change the estimated due date based on the ultrasound. And for the most part, they're still telling doctors to go with the estimated due date from the last menstrual period, unless there's a bigger discrepancy between the last menstrual period due date and the ultrasound due date. And they have a chart in their guidelines that kind of shows you, okay, if you're this gestational age, how much of a difference does there need to be? for you to go with the ultrasound due date. So that's why today still you see a lot of most people are still having their pregnancies dated by the last menstrual period and they don't change it unless there is a pretty big discrepancy between the last menstrual period and the ultrasound due date, which is interesting that the guidelines have gone that way given that ultrasound in general is thought to be more accurate than the last menstrual period. But again, we're still trying to calculate the estimated due date based on that 40-week Negley's rule. So let's talk about how long is a normal pregnancy is a due date, really a due date. I want to wrap this up by talking about the evidence around the length of normal pregnancy and talking about maybe some factors that affect the length of pregnancy. Now, one of the problems with looking at research on the length of pregnancy is that labor induction is so common that it's impossible today to know exactly what percentage of people would naturally go into labor on their own by a certain time point. And because of the high induction rate, when researchers measure the length of pregnancy, it's just very inaccurate. So we do, though, have a statistical method we can use. It's called survival analysis to accurately control for the fact that some people are being induced. So I've been able to find two studies that looked at the length or duration of pregnancy using this special kind of statistical analysis. One was published by Smith in 2001. They had 1,500 healthy people in their study where the due dates from their last menstrual period and their ultrasound were exact matches. So there was no discrepancy and they knew exactly how far along the pregnancy was. The researchers found that 50% of all women giving birth for the first time in this study gave birth by 40 weeks and five days, while 75% gave birth by 41 weeks and two days. Meanwhile, 50% of all people who had given birth at least once before gave birth by 40 weeks and three days, while 75% gave birth by 41 weeks. This means that for both first-time mothers and people who've given birth before in this study, the traditional estimated due date of 40 weeks was off by about three to five days. Actual pregnancy length was about five days longer than Negley's rule in a first-time mother and three days longer in someone who's given birth before. There was another study that used the same special kind of statistical analysis that was published by Jukic in 2013. In this study, they followed 125 healthy women and they've measured their hormone levels daily before conception and throughout that first part of pregnancy. The researchers actually knew the exact date of ovulation and even when the embryo implanted in the uterus. The researchers found that the time from ovulation to birth was 38 weeks and two days. And the reason that they used the time from ovulation to birth is because not everybody has a normal ovulation pattern. The median time from the last menstrual period to birth was 40 weeks and five days. So half of all of the women in this study gave birth by 40 weeks and five days, and 75% gave birth by 41 weeks and two days after the last menstrual period. 
Now, I said quite a few different factors that can affect the length of pregnancy. As I mentioned earlier, if your embryo took a few days longer to implant in the very beginning of your pregnancy, that might mean that you will have a longer pregnancy. Also, a family history of long pregnancies is probably the most important predictor of the length of your pregnancy. About half of your chance of experiencing a post-term birth, if you have one, comes from your genes. Not only your mother and your side of the family, but your partner's side of the family, because your partner contributes half of the genetic material to your baby. And the fetus actually also has an impact on when labor is triggered. Other things that can lengthen the duration of pregnancy include having a higher body mass index, gaining more weight during pregnancy, being older during your pregnancy, having a higher education level, being pregnant for the first time, being pregnant with a male baby, and experiencing environmental stress toward the end of pregnancy. So if we go back to the beginning when I talked about the new definitions of term and how how we have early term, full term, late term, and post term, about half of people will go into labor by 40 weeks and three to five days, which is during the term period. But the other half will go into labor closer into the late term period and some of them in the post term period. And although the duration of a pregnancy is typically about 40 weeks and three to five days instead of 40 weeks exactly, we do have research showing that with each subsequent week of pregnancy towards the end of pregnancy, the risk of health complications does go up. Now it remains low overall, but it does go up. And we'll talk more about this in the webinar, but the risk of cesarean goes up with each subsequent week. The risk of the mother experiencing an infection or the baby needing to be admitted to the NICU. And then there's also the risk of stillbirth, which we'll talk about in the webinar. So because of these risks, we have a conundrum where the normal length of pregnancy is one amount, but we have a culture that is trying to minimize risk by inducing labor early. So what does the evidence say about inducing labor at the beginning of the full term period at 39 weeks? So we're going to dive into that research at our webinar. So make sure you're registered at ebbirth.com slash webinar. If you want to read more about due dates, I'd encourage you to visit our signature article at ebbirth.com slash due dates. I go into a lot more detail about what risks and what complications go up towards the end of pregnancy. What about the risk of stillbirth? Are some people at a higher risk of stillbirth than others? And hint, the answer is yes. There are differences in risk in different populations. But I'm looking forward to talking with you more on the public webinar all about in, in elective induction for kind of preemptively lowering some of these risks and what the benefits and risks are of that practice. I hope you found this podcast helpful. Another perk of attending the webinar is we are going to be giving a sneak peek or a tour behind the scenes of our evidence-based birth professional membership. We will have a very time-limited sale of the evidence-based birth professional membership that will actually probably be over by the time the next podcast comes out. So if you've been thinking about trying out the evidence-based birth professional membership, make sure you attend that webinar to get the promotional code that we'll be giving out at the end of the webinar. All right, everybody, this wraps up our little mini series all about induction for different scenarios. Next week, we're going to be going back to interviewing some professionals in the field about the amazing work that they're doing. I'll talk with you all next week. Thanks. Bye. (music) 